Hi everyone, um, welcome, thank you for being there. Uh, my name is William Durand, I'm a French living in Germany. I work for a company called Mozilla um, and today I'm going to uh, talk about server-side rendering. Um, a few questions first. Um, who is not a JavaScript or front-end developer in the room? Okay. Um, who knows, who doesn't know about React or Vue, JS? the frameworks with, with which we do web applications in the client, React View, everyone knows, cool. Um, today, so I'm going to talk about server-side rendering uh, applied to JavaScript application that normally run in the browser. So there's uh, client-side only applications. And um, we want to put this client-side only application on the browser in the Node.js environment. That's the application uh, we call universal or isomorphic applications. Uh, before getting into server-side rendering, let's review a bit of history. Uh, before 2010, um, we were all doing a server-side uh, server rendered application with uh, server-side uh, frameworks, such as Symfony in PHP, um, Django in Python, and Ruby on Rails for Ruby. All these uh, frameworks were using template engines, and that's how we were um, rendering data into HTML. We were using, of course, a bit of JavaScript with uh, frameworks such as jQuery, uh, Yahoo UI, and all of uh, the other uh, JavaScript UI libraries back then. But these libraries were mainly used to enhance a bit um, the application with what I call effects, like we could do drag and drop, we could display a message and then make it disappear, uh, and so on. And my favorite back then was a Scriptaculous, maybe some of you know it. I was based on prototype, and for me that was amazing back then. Of course, at that time, we were also doing um, a bit of AJAX with XML HTTP requests, so we knew how to get data uh, from the client uh, to the server. We, were, we knew how to communicate between the client and the server. Then in 2011, uh, Backbone was all new, Node.js not so new, and people finally read um, Fielding's dissertation about REST architectures and how to write web, um, web services based on HTTP to write APIs. So around that time, from what I remember, um, everyone said, okay, let's uh, change the way we do a web application now. Uh, we are going to split the job into two parts, the API part with uh, the backend people, and then uh, the second part with uh, the front-end developers uh, with uh, client-side applications. Um, I'm sure you all know how it works, so I'm going to quickly describe this, this figure. Uh, the client requests the page, the page um, is sent back um, to the client by the server, but this page now is mostly empty, um, so the client has to download the application JavaScript bundle, and then once the JavaScript has been downloaded, um, the, the client has to load the JavaScript application, and then we get what we call the first meaningful paint, which is basically the UI, the application you get in the browser before there was blank page, blank page, blank page. And at that point, the user can interact with the application. And then for the rest, we can do uh, AJAX calls um, to the API to get data, and so on and so on. Um, in 2013, Facebook released uh, React, and that was a good news for uh, front-end developers because even though um, Backbone was nice because the architecture uh, to write client-side application was much better with Backbone than without, we were still struggling with how to write the UI part. Uh, we were actually using template engines as well, such as underscore template or mustache or handlebar. With React, we changed the way we were building UIs, and that was cool. Um, and at that time, Facebook also released something called Flux, uh, but it was only a document to explain how to do data management in a client-side application, but there was no implementation. So we had to wait for more two more years to get something called Redux, which was um, like the best option 
over the two years, and the couple React and Redux was a good news for front-end developers. Um, of course, with Amber and the Amber community and the Vue community, there were also similar um, libraries. And basically, for front-end developer, we thought that our problem was solved. We could focus again on creating value, on uh, focusing on the business, and not trying to um, think about which framework to use because there is this one and this one, but maybe this this other one will be uh, shut down in a month, and there will be a new one, and so on and so on. Um, but since then, some people said, okay, but this very nice JavaScript client side application, can we actually make it run on the server in a Node.js process? And of course, as for everything in JavaScript, we said yes. And that's how um, server-side rendering came, came out, basically. So here's a big picture about client-side rendering. The client wants to get a page, just as before. So it sends a request to the server. But then the server doesn't really uh, reply with a emp almost empty HTML. It actually loads the JavaScript application on the server, maybe get data on the API, and then it sends the HTML back to the client. And at that point, you get the first meaningful paint, which is basically the UI that loads in the browser. So with this um, way of uh, rendering an application, you don't have to wait too long to get uh, your application in the browser. But the client still has to um, download the application bundle, the JavaScript, um, and then to uh, boot the application in the browser. But it's slightly, more f it's slightly faster because everything has been done by the server before, so the client actually just checked that everything is, is uh, okay. Um, and then the user can interact with the application. So it's, it's very different than before uh, because when we get the UI, we cannot really interact with it right now. We have, we have, we have to wait until the, the, the client-side application has replaced uh, what the server has sent before. And then it behaves just like a normal uh, client-side application. Um, so, how it works on the server, so for every incoming request, the server has to create some sort of store or initial application state. This is common to any framework in Redux with React or in uh, Vuex with Vue. It's called a store, but it's just a way of having data. Then, of course, because um, the server gathers all the incoming requests, there is some sort of Root, um, routing mechanism to find which page to load depending on uh, which request has been made. So you have to make sure that your routing layer works in the browser as well as in a node process. And there is no window dot location on the, on the server, for instance. So let's say we know how to fix this. Um, we, have, we still have to load the component, get the HTML, and then send it back to the client. What are the benefits of doing server-side rendering? Uh, the first one is accessibility. It's accessibility in the sense of um, it's useful for people with a not so good internet connection or a not so fast and powerful uh, device, such as um, smartphones with a very really, um, low or slow CPU. You don't get any other benefit. Um, it has better performances because the user thinks it's faster. It's just a matter of user's uh, per perception because of the first meaningful paint that uh, appears earlier than with client-side rendering. As for a better user experience, um, you can actually uh, run. Um, it's not so difficult to, to make your client-side only application run on the server and to be able to use it without JavaScript. Um, it works for almost, it's not that difficult to make it work for almost all GET requests. Of course, that won't work for POST requests um, easily. And the last point uh, for this benefit is more uh, the business-oriented uh, ben benefit. For SEO and social sharing, 
um, you have you want to know um, if you, the, the, the bots, the crawlers, are able to find the information we are looking for uh, in, in the HTML sent by, by your server. Uh, it's known that Googlebot is actually quite good at browsing uh, JavaScript application. Um, this is an experiment made in November 2016, um, but there are limitations. Uh, for instance, uh, the Googlebot gives up after 10 seconds. So uh, for some reason, if the, the, the Googlebot isn't able to load fully your application in 10 seconds, uh, you basically um, sh lose uh, something for your business. And for this experiment, there, was, uh, there were uh, a few issues for, um, for the React router that wasn't working properly back then, um, which means depending on the libraries and frameworks you use, uh, maybe the Googlebot won't be uh, that good at uh, finding uh, and crawling um, your application. And there are other bots than the Googlebot, for instance, the Slack bot or the Facebook bot. And maybe they are not as good as the Googlebot. As for the drawbacks, um, SSR makes everything very complicated. Building a client-side uh, only application it's already tricky because you have to deal with all the browsers and the differences among the APIs and so on. Now you have to think that if you add SSR into the, into the game, it's, it's way more complicated. Also, the time to first byte is usually slower. The time to first byte is the time, uh, the resp more or less the response time of, of your server. Um, so it takes more time for the first request to get uh, a reply. Um, but Cloudflare says it's not a good metric. So that would be fine, but still, this is um, still something uh, good to know. And also, uh, depending on the framework you use, uh, for instance, with React, um, the render to string, so the method that is used to uh, get um, the UI tree and um, get back the HTML generated by this, uh, this UI tree, so basically your application, uh, it holds the event loop, the node loop. Um, so um, you cannot uh, process another request on this server until you get you get the HTML. So why is it so complicated, really? Uh, so first of all, there are two different environments and only one code base. If you don't want one code base, it's not a universal application anymore. Um, and the two different environments are Node.js and the browser. Then you have everything like cookies, redirects, errors, HTTP statuses, and Last but not least, data fetching before rendering. So for the two diff different environments, uh, Babel helps a lot. Mm, Webpack as well. But then you have to, uh, you cannot just uh, say, I'm, I'm going to use this library or this uh, nice um, project on GitHub, because you have to make sure that it's actually an isomorphic uh, library. Um, so you need uh, this. Um, this uh, particular project um, to be able to work in a node context as well as in a browser context. And also, you likely need a polyfile as well. For cookies, redirects, errors, HTTP statuses, um, I will explain a bit later for the redirects and the errors. Uh, you have to find nice tricks for everything like this. And this is not something people used to tell you, actually. And for that data fetching before rendering, um, that's cool because I had to change my slides, uh, or at least the, the, the idea of my presentation, a month ago because there used to be two approaches, but no, uh, thanks to the React team, there is only one way of doing uh, things, which is using a static asynchronous method on the page level components to fetch the data and some sort of promise.all on the server to make sure we wait for this, uh, this asynchronous method uh, to be uh, resolved. Because, of course, uh, no one in the JavaScript community um, fetch data in a synchronous manner. It's all asynchronous. And it's quite OK in the, in the browser, because you have time to wait. And, and then most framework react to, to some sort of event when the data are, are there. But on the server, you don't really want your server to wait indefinitely uh, for, for the data. So you have to know when it starts, which is pretty simple, but also when it should be uh, the end. And this is difficult. 
The other option back then was double render, which was nice because you didn't have to introduce anything um, that you wouldn't use in a client-side only application. But a month ago or so, React, the React team wrote this blog post about an update on async rendering with React and made it clear that this double render uh, approach was more a hack and we shouldn't do this anymore, uh, which is not very nice because the idons.mozilla.org website on, for, for on which I'm, I'm working on um, uses this double render technique and I'll cover this, this, uh, this later. So now let's review a few examples. I, um, I asked the question about React and Vue before because uh, this example are based on React and Vue. So with React, it's very simple. They offer a render to string method um, to render a UI tree with the components on the server, but that's basically it. There is no guidelines. There is no um, explanation of what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. Um, I don't think there is anything related to all the do server-side rendering at Facebook. And that's why, because usually they let the community decide, which is nice, but sometimes annoying, especially when uh, you say, okay, let's do this approach. And then uh, two years later, you have to rewrite your code because that was not the, the correct approach. I'm going to introduce a naive example. If you don't really see the, um, the code, that's fine because it's more just um, a picture than, than um, a useful, uh, useful information. For every um, application, client-side application that you want to run on the server, you need a server code. Usually it's an express application that um, handles all the incoming requests. The first thing you have to uh, do when you get a new request, incoming request, is creating some sort of context and or uh, application state. That's the fir first lines. Um, and then you want to render uh, your application and to get the, the, um, the markup, to get the HTML generated by, by your um, application. But the thing is, um, because this, um, this application catches all the incoming requests, you have some sort of uh, routing layer to put in place. Uh, to determine which um, component you want to load, uh, to which page you want to load, basically. And as I said before, uh, there is no uh, window, dot doc, uh, window dot location on the server. So you have to make sure your routing library uh, handles the server context as well as the browser context. Say you know that uh, like uh, if you use React router, they are able to uh, provide a static router, so you can do it. Next step is to uh, make sure there is no redirect because on, on the, um, in the browser, if you want to make a redirect, it's pretty easy. Window.location equal the new, um, the new path, and then that's it. But it doesn't work like that on the server because on the server, a server redirect is a, HT, a response, HTTP response with a HTTP header uh, 301 or 302 with the path. So. You have to um, deal with this on the server, and then if you don't have a redirect, you are able to render uh, to return the HTML. So for this, you need to um, get the state that has been generated on the on the server and the HTML, and then replace um, placeholders in the index.html file usually to simulate what would happen in uh, in the browser. Then once you have this. HTML with all the data inside, you send this uh, back to the, to the client. Which means you have to uh, modify a bit um, and introduce placeholder in the index.html file. This works for every project. This is for React and the create React app application, but that will work uh, ex exactly the same with Vue. And last but not least, you have to make sure that this state you serialized uh, at, on the server in in the HTML response is used by the client-side application when it loads 
Otherwise, you have to. Uh, otherwise, the, the the client side application doesn't really know uh, what has been done by the server before, and tries to redo uh, everything, which is uh, not good, obviously, because uh, you lose um, the 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 benefit of uh, pre-rendering on on the server. But then again, this is uh, this was a naive example and there is no data fetching and no error handling. So if you want to do only this because you don't fetch any data, you can do this. You c there are also projects to um, actually create static content from, from a, a React application. But if you want to have uh, data fetching and so on, then uh, you need to implement a way of fetching data. Uh, that's what uh, next.js did, uh, which is a React-based framework, but it which is SSR ready. And they, of course, introduced a new method on every React component that is called get initial props. It's a static method, asynchronous, and you get a lot of information as uh, parameters of, the, of this method. So for instance, if you use um, Redux, you get the store. You have a Boolean flag to know uh, whether you are on the server or not, and other information coming from um, the other layers of your application. That's what we call props uh, in a React context. For instance, you get the, the information from the routing, which is interesting to know um, which, which ID you get in the URL in order to fetch the right resource the, with that ID, and so on and so on. As for Vue.js, it's a bit different because I guess it is officially supported, not because it's um, enabled by default in Vue, but at least there is this uh, doc official documentation called ssr.vuejs.org that is very amazing. Um, if you look at this documentation, they explain everything, and the first steps are exactly the same uh, as uh, my naive example, but they go uh, further explaining how to do uh, da data fetching, and that's all we can learn that it's not easy. But they also um, think that using um, async data method was, was a, a good thing. And finally, there is next.js, which is like next, but for Vue. It's actually very inspired by next. That's what they put on the, on the, the, the web page, the, yeah, the on page of the project. And they, um, they implement everything that is described in ssr.vuejs.org. And this next or next are very good because they solve most of the problems we have when we want to introduce SSR um, in, um, in our application. But of course, it won't, um, it won't resolve other problems we can have when, doing, uh, when putting uh, a client-side, initially client-side only application on the server. And that's what um, I'm going to explain now with some lesson uh, learned writing a server-side rendered application. The, um, the application I'm going to, uh, to talk about now is called addons.mozilla.org. It's this one in case you haven't um, used it before. It's a universal React and Redux application. We have internationalization and localization. Uh, so uh, this morning we saw a talk about um, directions for Airbnb. We had to deal with this as well. Um, we have, I think, 50 different languages uh, supported, not fully. Um, I would say that we have 10 to 15 uh, fully supported languages. We have very strict um, um, content security policies, um, which is nice for the, hand use, for the end user, sorry, but not so nice when you're a developer because it makes a bit f things a bit more complicated. And of course, uh, as most Mozilla projects, it's all open source and you can check it out at mozilla uh, slash addons frontend. You can even contribute if you like, actually. So first lesson learned, uh, double render is a fragile hack. Don't use it. 
This is something we didn't fully um, learn yet because we haven't uh, switched to something else. But the, uh, the idea behind uh, double render was to render the application once. When you render an application like React once, usually you have um, lifecycle methods that are called. And this lifecycle methods, we, uh, like component will mount, for instance, we put um, a way to fetch data. So we, we use React, uh, Redux, so we dispatch um, actions to fetch data. And then once um, this, this action has been dispatched, we have a, um, a way to uh, end them, to, s to send a signal to end them. And then um, once these um, this actions are, have ended, we get the data. And when you get the data, new data in, in a React Redux application, you, get, you, you trigger um, a new update. update. And that's why it's called double render. We run one uh, a first time to trigger fetch calls, uh, PI calls, and then you, we get the second render. And that's the second render we use for um, rendering, the, um, returning the HTML um, to the client, which is which is pretty nice because we only use um, lifecycle methods part of React. But the problem is, and that's what um, was described in um, in the React blog post. This uh, lifecycle method we were we are using, they are deprecated now and they will be removed soon. So we have to move to something else because we won't be able to upgrade to new uh, React version in in the near future. Also, the problem with this double render, but I don't think uh, that would be also uh, something we could solve um, with the asynchronous method is that we have a lot of se what we call secondary data. So when we load a page for an, ad an add-on, we have um, the information for that add-on, but we also have other information such as the other add-ons made by these developers or um, the, the reviews for the first reviews for uh, this add-on or add-on um, related add-ons related to that add-on. Um, that's what we call um, secondary data because we are not able to fetch this data before we get the, um, the first uh, add-on information, the first data. Um, currently, for all the secondary data, we have to render them uh, on the client only, which is a good trade-off because usually this, uh, this secondary data are related to secondary content as well. And when the page load, we don't see them. And even if we would uh, see some parts of the UI where we had no data, we have actually loaders everywhere. So we have like the content with placeholders that are loader and it, it's loading and then we get the information eventually. Second thing we keep learning is to be always careful. Um, in the browser context, when you have an indefined reference, sometimes it's fine. Um, this, this is a bit hot, but why not? I mean, the, the web application didn't even notice that there was an indefined reference and it, it still works. But if it's not, um, it probably breaks the application so you cannot use it anymore, but that's fine in the sense that it doesn't like close all your tabs and um, kill your browser and uh, put your laptop on fire. Um, just just um, freeze, the, um, freeze the application. When you have an indefined reference or some sort of, sort of uh, promise, not, uh, not uh, promise errors, not called, not caught, um, you get at, at best, uh, 500 error, which is not nice to have a server error, but often it will terminate um, your node process. So if you don't have, uh, so this is not cool, uh, really. Uh, if it terminates your process and you don't have um, a way to spin a new process, your server is basic basically out, which is not good. And uh, that's why it's often game over. So um, this also means that for window, document, and all of the objects we have in the browser only 
uh, we have to make sure we never use something that um, relies on such objects that are only available in the browser. That's very important, and that's that's actually uh, tricky. Error handling is tough. Um, it's tough because in the in the in the browser it's pretty easy. Uh, there is an error. We can display a message. Uh, there is an error because the the data uh, are not available or, so, or something. It's fine. We redirect to the 404 uh, page. But in the browser context, uh, in the server context, if you have a, such an error like 404, you cannot just say, "Okay, go to the 404 page." You have to make sure that there is a proper uh, status code, HTTP status code 404, and um, even if you have your, uh, the correct HTTP status code, you don't really want to load the wrong component or no component at all to uh, send an HTML that is either empty or that, it, or that says internal server error, whereas it was a 404. So this, you have to deal with that as well on both the server and the client, which means you have to write code that must work well in the browser context, but if it's in the server context, it tells to work but differently. And you will also end up writing code for the client that sort of talks to, to the server. For instance, for the redirect, um, you have to make sure that there is something in the, co the application context that says to the server, uh, the client side application got a redirect, uh, do what you want to do, uh, what needs to be done on the server. Debugging made uh, not really easy, but complex. Um, it's cool to write web applications for the client in, in the browser uh, nowadays because Firefox and Chrome, they have uh, very nice dev tools, they have the amazing dev tools for Redux, for React, and so on, for Vue as well. Um, but when you uh, want to test your application on the server, you don't have this anymore. Um, you still have an a, a isomorphic logging layer, of course, but you don't have the dev tools anymore. And for instance, here is an example of a logs we have for application. So I don't think these lines are uh, enough for a single um, call to the server. I also stripped some uh, timestamps and uh, node process IDs and so on. And that's the thing you have to read if you want to understand what happened to the, to the server, which is not cool. So we don't do this. Usually, what we have instead is a configuration flag to disable SSR, so that we can um, write our code uh, in a client-side mode only, which is cool because then we have a better user uh, developer experience. But the problem is uh, sometimes we forget to turn this flag off, and we ship a pull request with a bug for the server. Not nice. When you write um, server-side um, rendered applications, you get new bugs. Um, I have selected two of them. The first is cannot load an add-on on the client side, but it works on the server, which is quite, of quite funny because initially we had the client side only application. So when things don't work in the browser, that's sort of weird, especially when it works only on the server. Usually it's the other way around. Um, I guess in this, for this issue, there was an encoding issue. Uh, we were encoding the API uh, URL, and I think that was encoded twice on the client because we were relying on, on uh, some sort of isomorphic library, and there was yeah a problem only for the client. And on the server, because Node is different, is slightly different, there was no double encoding, and there was there was no issue. The second one is server error received when navigating when navigating with browser back button from page two to page one in a specific page. That's the GIF here. Um, so the tester has um, loaded uh, successfully um, a collection detail page. A collection of add-ons is just like a list of add-ons you like, for instance. Then um, the tester goes to page two. So this is a client-side um, um, navigation. Then it wants to go back to the previous page by hitting the back button, and then boom, server error. If you reload this page, 
you will get the page. And the problem was, um, we assume that there was no page parameter in the query string for in, in the server context, but there was always a page parameter in the client side context because we use pagination and when you use pagination, uh, it should have happened only uh, in client side. But if you hit the, the back button, then it's also client side, but it doesn't uh, use the pagination. And this kind of bugs, it's not all the time, I would say, but it's often that we have to make sure everything works uh, by um, reloading the page, trying to come up with a situation when we get to this page with a client side only navigation, then try to reload, then train back button, then uh, blah, 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 blah. No random allowed. Um, another fun bug, page is stuck in loading mode when an error is run. Uh, loading mode means for us that we um, render only the loading placeholders, but not the real content. This happened because the way we deal with error, um, we do that uh, on, a, um, on a component bas basis and our middleware to that um, deals with error used um, a random ID to make sure we had um, um, a random uh, state in our, in, our, um, in our Redux store in order to store uh, the error message and all the error information. Um, the problem is we didn't need randomness, we needed uniqueness. But often when we uh, think about uniqueness, then we say, okay, let's, do, let's use uh, mat.random because uh, randomness is often uniqueness, often. Um, but that, that was wrong, a wrong assumption. So by switching to a uniqueness way of generating IDs, we were able to, uh, to fix this, this bug. Because you, you, you cannot have random in your application because um, when you load on the server, the HTML that is sent back to the client, the client also loads the JavaScript and makes sure there is no uh, differences. Um, this morning at the Airbnb conference, um, Maya also uh, talked about this. It's also a problem for accessibility um, because for most um, UI libraries such as Material UI or Bootstrap, they tend to use random IDs to make sure a label is bound to uh, an input. And th that's why there is a RFC uh, for React for introducing isomorphic IDs. You must have a fresh isolated server context, um, which means when there is an incoming request, there shouldn't be any uh, information retained in memory on the server. You don't want to have an application scope, only request scope. In our case, for this bug, where the active local was leaking between several responses, the problem was that the way we were initializing Moment, the library for um, uh, formatting dates and time, was at the uh, application scope for some reason. And when we were um, querying the same, the exact same URL with the same local 10 times, we ended up with a very different dates. Um, this was actually tricky to um, to find um, because, as I said, and that was, I think, React 16 actually um, highlighted this bug because before React 16, React was um, silently replacing uh, the JavaScript, uh, the HTML generating on the client side. So if even if the HTML sent by the, the server was, uh, was wrong, uh, it was so fast for React to boot the application and replaces uh, the HTML in the browser that we almost never noticed this. But one of our testers actually noticed something blinking and uh, she, keep, she kept dinging in, uh, for this issue and eventually uh, we found the bug and we were able to fix it. That was, I think, uh, one line, one line fix, but that's not nice. Uh, also, when you do SSR, you need more servers. Um, this was a nice bug. We had um, 24 hours after Firefox Quantum or Firefox um, 57 was released last, last November. 
And one of our ops said, okay, so in order to reduce the number of uh, 500 caused by the issue, we had to bump up the number of instances in the cluster from 8 to 40, which is a good, I mean, it's quite a huge gap. And that's because, as I said before, the render to string method holds the event loop. So um, after Firefox Quantum um, was released, Everyone switched from Chrome to Firefox, right? Uh, because it was so beautiful to have a very nice browser such as Firefox. But then they said, okay, uh, it's nice to have a faster browser than before, uh, but maybe you now we should find our add-ons, right? And, and that's why they all came to addons.mozilla.org. There was li li literally millions of users, and that's why we had to get more servers. There are also security considerations uh, when doing SSR because your client-side application now runs on the server, uh, so you don't really want to leak sensitive data on the server, such as environment variables. You don't want to expose them by accident. And also, when you serialize the state from the server to the client, you have to escape it, otherwise you get uh, excesses. What's nice about React, I think it's probably the same with you, uh, it's you have nice, useful dev warnings when something is different between the client and the server. Uh, don't ignore them because it's usually a bug. And also we can, that's like the most positive slide I would say, uh, we can test everything. We can test all, uh, all cases, um, unit test, I mean. so. That's very nice because we are able to exactly reproduce um, like the, the back button bug. We were able to cover it with a, with a test case and to uh, prove the bug with a test case. And also um, we were able to say, okay, the, the, the fix works because the, the test case no passes. So what? Um, I think you may not need SSR. Um, if you need it, uh, would recommend to use a format that is SSR ready. That won't uh, avoid the, all the problems I covered before, but at least you will have um, a good architecture to fetch data, to handle errors, and so on and so on. There are also other IDs uh, related to SSR. One of them is prehender.io. I think it's some sort of proxy that keeps the HTML that has been generated by your client side on the application and is able to uh, feed um, bros, uh, but with it, um, with the new Chrome and Firefox headless mode, uh, maybe that would be a solution to run this browser, or maybe not, to run this browser on, on the server and so that you will end up doing only a client side on the application, but you will, you will be able to still render the HTML on the server. And with progressive web application and service workers, you might be able to fix the performance, uh, I mean, the, um, the accessibility issues related to uh, not so good internet connection and uh, not so powerful devices. Also, thank you for my, my team for all the, um, the stories about what they learned as well as me on, on uh, working on addons.mozilla.org. And thank you for your attention.